Welcome back, and to those who are joining us for the panel portion, hello. Once again, we are pleased to be hosting the Great Disconnect event and are quite lucky to have it as part of the Seniors Week program. This evening, we are expecting over 170 guests ranging from all across the province of Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Sydney. Just incredible, and I can't wait for the discussion to come. But before that happens, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. At this time, we're going to lax the mute mic option to our panelists so they could easily jump on and off the virtual stage, which is where I am. Um, so as the audience, we would ask that you check your mics and have them remain muted if you are not a panelist. If you have any questions, these could be submitted through the bottom right button, which I believe is over there on your screen, <laughs> called Q&A. Please send those questions along and we will address them at the end. Should you need any assistance, our IT team will be supporting us throughout the event. With that, I am pleased to invite my colleague, the amazing moderator for the evening, Sharon Matthewman. She's our Seniors and Community Development Facilitator for the City of Chestermere. This evening, Sharon will be joined by someone that may look familiar to all after watching the film, Tamar Solomon. Tamar is the director, producer, and creator of the film. He's also a neighboring enthusiast. Sarah Douglas will also be accompanying us this evening. She's the story editor and writer of the film. Um, so Dr. Preston Couteau, who's known by his friends and neighbors as Preston. He's also the author of All Things Love and Neighborhoods. Dr. Sarah Alanagi Poor, a municipal planner at the city of Chestermere. Patricia Morgan, author and often referred to as the spunky seniorpreneur. And another familiar face from the film is Dr. Trevor Hancock, a public health physician and health promotion consultant. And last but not least, Heather Keem, team lead for deepening communities with the Tamarack Institute. Over to you, Sharon. Seeing completely dries out from the continual Even the bridge is going to be You're just muted, Sharon. Sorry, sorry about that. I had it all ready to go, of course. Okay, so thank you very much for the wonderful introduction, Danielle. It's not often that I am stuck for words, <laughs> but what a thought provoking and emotionally impacting documentary. Wheeling around in my mind are some of the comments statements made. There is no higher value than independence. By nature, social animals. Isolation, worst punishment you can have as a human being. Connection has never been so vital as it is now. And plugged in lives. How many of us can resonate with this over the last year or so? I am sure we all have so many thoughts at this time. Now, I would like to invite any of the panelists to share if there was anything that resonated with you after watching the film that you would like to expand on. Anybody care to, to say, you know, whether what, whether it was the reopening of communities or how isolation plays a role in the community, or as a film inspired you in different ways? Hi, Sharon. Good evening, everyone. Maybe I can go ahead. Please do. Please do. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, based on the movie that we just watched, um, I looked at the subject from a, a planning perspective as I'm a municipal planner. And uh, in my day-to-day -day job, I always ask myself how we can create places in our cities that help our residents to be more healthy, happier, and social. Uh, based on my research and work experience, sustainable urban planning with great place ma making uh, acts as a model that basically highlights the importance of place uh, in every design by architects and planners. Uh, planners should be encouraged to use technology and design with innovation and uh, put play put people always um, uh, in the focal point for uh, planning and design of places. To me, uh, basically four um, dimensions are equally required and should all contribute synergistically 
uh, together to the well-functioning place-making ideas. Of course, first is the idea of place itself, which considers local context, uh, conditions, and culture of a place that lay vital roles in the design of a livable community with happy residents, and of course, people knowing each other in that place. And uh, concepts such as place attachment and place identity uh, underscore the importance of fostering meaning into the building and landscapes that we create as planners. And second um, are people. People reside in the core of not only our cities and communities, but also stand front and center in the environmental design professions. Environment and behavior are tightly correlated, a reality that more planners and designers must understand and address in neighborhood development. Human perception and cognition loom large in the ways that uh, we use a space, see our world, and find our place. The third element is technology. In our modern ethos, technologies of all types serve to empower and improve not only products, but also processes. Our quest for more sustainable contemporary neighborhood design warrants our wise yet cautious deployment of such tools from building inform information modeling uh, to a smart houses and intelligent uh, cities. Uh, anyway, like always planners and architects need to deploy advanced technologies in tandem with more conventional ways for seeing, thinking and acting correctly. The fourth element, but not the last one, um, the innovation element. Uh, finally, planners and architects, they must chase innovation, embarrass um, experimentation, and assume greater risk. Given the arguably high um, stakes involved, for example, global warming, uh, resource depletion, uh, and etc., we need to advance our solution in older and more clever ways to create good places. Uh, we need to be far more caring, innovative, and holistic, and be willing to take risks uh, to achieve the positive outcomes that ultimately benefit people in our society. If we have great places, good cities, people, they start talking with each other and socialize and all the other elements that we just watch at in this movie uh, will be the result. So as a matter of fact, we will prevent a lot of other uh, future diseases in uh, good city planning, with good city planning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alag Nagy Paul. That is great to actually have a planner's perspective um, so thank you for that. That was great. So anybody else would like to talk about how it resonates with you about, you know, changing or uplifting the community or perhaps how isolation plays a role in the community? Well, it's Trevor Hancock here and um, hello, Dr. Hancock. I just want I just want to share briefly because um, a thought that came to me, this is about the third or fourth time I've done this with uh, Tamar and Sarah, and it is incidentally every time I see it, I love this movie more and more. It's a beautiful movie. Um, but one of the things I realized when we did it uh, for the neighborhoods group in uh, the city of Victoria a few months ago is, is two things uh, that are very much connected. And one of them I call the COVID reveal. I think that we've learned a lot from COVID. And what we've learned is that Connections matter, community matters, caring matters. We've also learned that equity matters, that we've got a lot of essential workers who are uh, we're not connected to in the sense that when we're not supporting them in the way they need to be supported. Um, and and uh, also that nature matters. But so, so uh, COVID has told us a whole lot of things about the way our societies function, our communities function or don't function. Um, but the other thing that came to me in, in that session, and I've been thinking about and talking about ever since, is that it the movie's called The Great Disconnect. What we need after COVID is The Great Reconnect. Absolutely. And so I've been giving some thought to how that might happen, but I maybe that's something we'll talk about later. But I just want people to start thinking not so much about 
uh, the problem which the, the movie posed, but beyond the problem which the movie also started to get at, the need for that great reconnect, and even more so after COVID. And the movie was made before COVID. But, but now after COVID, that reconnection is really important. And that reconnection mostly has to be face to face, not remote. Yeah, absolutely. I would totally agree. I mean, um, COVID has taught us so many things, not only showed us so many things, but taught us so many things. So, uh, Tamara, I hope you're listening very carefully to this about uh, a follow up to this. So thank you very much, Dr. Hancock, for your comments. Is there any more panelist um, comments based on that question? I'd like to jump in. Um, and it's a it's a great segue to what Dr. Trevor Hancock has has said. Um, before COVID, uh, there was this fear, the fear of bothering your neighbor, the fear of bothering somebody. And um, I was one of those people who didn't take the toilet paper shortage seriously. And our family was down to one roll. And I had no choice but to get over that fear. And I put out a call. Uh, and next thing I knew, I was so overwhelmed. I had toilet paper delivered to my door. I went, I walked out and there was this mound of toilet paper. And so um, this this uh, documentary brought up, I'm like, I wonder if we need to do the the great baking. Because if we can borrow a cup of sugar, bring that borrowing a cup of sugar back, because borrowing a cup of sugar is more than just borrowing a cup of sugar. It's about building a sense of belonging. You know, I, I need sugar. Someone else has it, or I need a toilet paper. Um, I felt like th the person who gave me gets that feeling of, you know what? I belong here because I had something to contribute. You know, it's more, it's boring. A cup of sugar is like filling your soul. It's, it's human nature to help others. So being able to trade and swap and share. Um, and then it's, it's boring. A cup of sugar is like fostering connections. And, you know, once you know that somebody has sugar, you go to the next neighbor who's, who runs out of sugar. Do you know that Susie has sugar? She'll lend you some. Do you know that so-and-so has a lawnmower? Do you know? And it starts building that whole connection and fostering connection. And lastly, you know, sugar helps you bake and bake is food and food builds connections and happiness. And we all come together and, you know, share that cookie that that sugar made. And so it's getting over and COVID has really helped getting over that fear of asking for help. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you, with you there, Heather. And, you know, I think we need to get over our pride as well, because, yeah. you know, a lot of people do not want to go to the neighbors and ask for a cup of sugar. But as you said, that is absolutely the best way to connect with your neighbor. So um, hopefully we'll see more of that going on in the future. Thank you so much for your comments. Just to just to build on that, I'm not going to speak at length, but that brings to mind the story of Stone Soup. Oh, yes. If you don't know the story of Stone Soup, they should check it out. But that's that takes that to the next level. Okay, we're actually going to put that in our chat box, Dr. Hancock, for folks to uh, have a peruse afterwards. So thank you. Okay, so I'm uh, moving on to questions for Sarah, Sarah and Tama, the filmmakers. So, Tama, this first one is going to be directed to you. I think we're all so very curious to find out what your inspiration was for the film. Would you care to tell us a little bit more about that? With pleasure. Yeah, it's such great commentary already. So thank you so much. And thank you to the City System here for, for putting on the screening. The inspiration just really comes from my passion for health and wellness. Um, as you saw in the film, I have a career uh, working in nutrition and in, in, uh, in exercise, and that was largely my uh, integration to the world of health. Um, but in in the world of health, there was lots of research around longevity, and we know that um, some of the longest living societies in the world uh, exist out there, and tons of research was done on them, showing that they eat really well, they live off the land, and they exercise, uh, but they're also really socially connected. and uh, multiple researchers would agree that that was likely the X factor as to the reason that they were living such long and healthy lives. So I've always had that as background knowledge uh, years prior to the making of the film. And as you saw, I ended up in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica observing these Rastafarians. And at the time, we weren't quite sure yet what the film was about. 
we can get into these remote areas in Jamaica and which would make for beautiful footage as, as some of you saw. But um, while I was up there observing these Rastafarians, I just saw this sort of microcosm of what I had read in these books about uh, these people who are just um, socially connected and really valuing community, valuing friendship, being accepting of, of, uh, of, of, of each other. And so that's what really sort of stuck with me, even though I was up there for, for a few more few more days. And Sarah and I sat back down when I came back from Jamaica. And I said, you know, this this aspect of community is is sort of something I, I understand, but I, I wonder if there's something there to to explore. And we we followed our intuition. And thankfully we did because we got to meet people like Trevor and many of the other interviews that you saw in the film who really led uh, led us to the story that Sarah ended up story editing into what you saw tonight. So hopefully everybody enjoyed the film. Absolutely beautiful inspiration. That is amazing. But, you know, next time if you decide to go back to Jamaica and shoot this in the mountains, I think everybody on here will be coming <laughs> with you. We'll all participate. <laughs> so thank you very much. That's absolutely beautiful. Okay, this next one for Sarah. So, Sarah, you know, the release and the promotion of the film was in 2018. Hmm. Can you tell us if you've heard any general themes about the value of knowing your neighbours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, obviously, our screenings back in 2018 versus now in 2021 are, are completely different. Obviously, they were in person prior and uh, people sort of were living in a different in a different time. And I think at, at that time when we were screening, it was almost a, a plea. You were trying to get people to understand that this was a real issue. You know, and I think a lot of times people would see the film and be like, oh, like I have friends. I talk to my family like what's the problem, you know? And then we would get messages trickling in of like, oh, I'm, I'm starting to understand it. You know, I can improve this, I can improve that. I really wanna meet my neighbors. I took a small step. But then I think when COVID hit, we got a lot of people reaching out to us saying like, wow, I can't stop thinking about your film. And I wish I would have applied those lessons prior to COVID when I had the opportunity and now I have more of a stronger intention of after things start to open up again, what I really want my community ties to look like. Um, so for us, unfortunately, we never want obviously a pandemic to hit and people to go through it. But it is interesting. I think, as you know, Trevor mentioned, it's sort of, you know, this lessening this lesson of like, what have we learned from this? And we just really hope that people keep those intentions and they follow through with those intentions when we get back to sort of this this new normal. Um, and I think, though, because our lives have become hyper local, you know, even with the less commuting, less traveling, I think people have rediscovered their their locality, um, you know, and what's really around them and who is around them. So even we've had people tell us like, oh, I now spend more time in my dog park and it's so much busier than it was before. Or I, you know, even for us, the other day we met somebody in the park across the street that's lived across from us for over a year and we wouldn't have, have known that. But now that we're all sort of spending, rediscovering our neighborhoods and spending more times in our, our local um, locality that we've discovered so much more. And I think that even, you know, planning is, is really important, but it's how do we get those people to actually use the the spaces that are cleverly created by the planners and I, I hope that we've all learned lessons in that as well and i think one more thing i'll just add in terms of neighbors um it's given people i think a sense of reassurance as well like for us even like our, our parents and our families are in different cities than we are and i'm comforted knowing that my parents have relationships with their neighbors so i know if there's something going on with them that they do have people around them and i think same thing for us that we have that sense of safety of you know the people that are, are closer proximity to us and i'm i'm hoping that 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 lesson has also stood out for people as well um, throughout this time. And, and hopefully that, you know, our film can help to highlight. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I've got to be honest, I've actually watched your documentary about three times and I've learned so much from it each time as a seniors and community development facilitator and also, you know, working in the community uh, with very, uh, with um, very diverse neighborhoods. There's so many lessons that we can apply and, um, as municipalities as well, we can certainly learn a lot from this. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Okay, so this question is to you both, and I don't know who wants to go first. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, tell me a little bit more about how has the film changed you? Has the film changed you? It may not have changed you. 
It's changed us. It's changed us. The best of the worst. For, <laughs> yeah. for, for, for the best, for sure. Uh, I think I think one thing that I would say about myself is that I've always been relatively extroverted, always in touch with friends, not afraid to um, interrupt a neighbor, not afraid to be the weird guy in the elevator to interrupt somebody <laughs> and, and say hi. And so I've always, that's always been a part of my life. So I've had that part, I'd say relatively well, obviously the, the film taught me a lot about valuing that even more. But I think as the film transitions from saying we need to connect for the sake of connection, for the sake of having fun, having pints, having coffees with friends is all really important. Uh, but then there's that, that piece of getting together with others to make your community a better place. And I think that that's, that's, that's one big message that the family hits home. John Halliwell ends up following uh, Trevor's line by saying, we need to make lives better for this generation and future generations. And there's a whole boat of challenges um, that we face. And I think that it's going to be really important that we face them together. So, you know, regardless, you, there could be, you, you might be really interested in a particular social cause, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the ones that are always um, making the headlines, but what is it that you're passionate about changing and making better? Um, start there. And that's really, I think, where uh, Sarah and I have really paid attention. There's been some things that we never would have really gotten involved in, but we do now because we understand its value and its importance. Mm -hmm, definitely. And I, I would say that I'm different and, you know, I'm not a Tamar, I'm not a, a Kristen <laughs> or, or a Paul Bourne, you know, I'm not that person that's really comfortable just putting myself out there. Um, so I found, though, that the kind of thinking and reflecting of the film, like I don't think I would ha like I admire Kirsten and her courage for putting herself up there, but I, you know, I, I guess maybe I represent the people who look at that and are terrified. And so I sort of thought, okay, well, what, what's the low hanging fruit for me? Like, what is the first step that I can do that I feel like I'm engaging with other people? And you know, what can I do for my own community well being? And even that idea that if I connect with someone else, it's like I have something to offer for them. So it's not just about me. It's about you know making eye contact, making small talk because you don't you don't know what other people are going through so I just set a few intentions you know of trying to you know talk to people more in the elevator or having more intentional small talk conversations and then um, of course I find that with the the community involvement is a great way to sort of um, center center the interaction around an activity which can help yeah, yeah. break the ice you know so Absolutely. instead of just sort of saying I'm going to throw a party and cross my fingers and hope people come it's like oh well I know that I'm going to get together with like-minded people and, and, the, and the attention will be on the activity rather than the people so that was sort of an easier way for me to integrate into uh, connecting more with people in my community. Thank you so you know when we talk about lessons from this film um is there any additional lessons that you've applied in your own life or you don't want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I mean, yeah, just like what we were saying. Uh, I mean, I often think just about, I'm a food person, so I, I love food. I love <laughs> gardens and community gardens. Um, I took over a plot that was in front of our condo that no one was taking care of uh, because, yeah, I wanted to plant some food. And then in doing that, people in the condominium uh, would be walking by and asking what I was doing. And some people were really interested in following along and kind of doing it with me and with Sarah and I. So that was, I'd say, something that was, and that happened during COVID. So that's why I, I tend to resort to that story. Um, and then, yeah, we just started to know people within the condo that we didn't know. We became friends with some. And I think that's one of the interesting things, too, with regarding to the whole neighbor principle is that they don't always have to be your friends, right? They're neighbors. Some can turn into friends. Some don't. Um, that's the one story I, I, I think about that was, was yeah. something I actively involved myself in that, that brought other people together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, sorry, Sarah, I cut you off. No, that's okay. Go ahead. No, no you go ahead. <laughs> I think just nurturing, nurturing what you have and building on what you have. And I think knowing too, like, again, going back to the idea of locality of um, if we want these spaces to exist, if we want in our, in our neighborhoods, if we want to, uh, you know, connect with people, if we want, you know, these shops and these places, we have to use them and we have to promote them and we have to get other people excited by them because otherwise they're going to go away. And that would be really sad, especially now knowing, you know, the negative, uh, not just like, 
you know, it just doesn't, it feels, it doesn't feel good to be lonely, but it's also really detrimental to your health. And so I think just to sort of really be advocates for that and champions of your neighborhood and to, uh, to get other people excited about it as well and not to take it for granted that maybe people have before. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when we talk about food being a great motivator, hopefully when all the restrictions and conditions and public health measures are lifted, block parties, what better way to bring people together with food and everything else. Thank you so much, both of you. Thanks. Okay, Patricia, so you are the author of Understanding Loneliness, What to Do for Yourself and Others. So when we talk about loneliness, what do you suggest we do to counteract our moments of feeling lonely? Oh, thank you for asking. Uh, well, the first step I discovered was to admit to it. Yeah, and oftentimes people don't know that they are feeling lonely. Last September, I myself broke out into tears. And as a therapist, I took pause and did what I told my clients to do, and that is to notice myself. And my skin was longing for touch, just craving for it. Um, anxiety and depression often show up, but actually it's loneliness. I had clients that showed up with anger, um, with disconnect with other people. And we have a culture that does a lot of shaming around loneliness. So if I say, gosh, I'm feeling lonely, am I going to look like a big loser that I don't have any friends? So I think the first step as an individual is to admit, yes, I'm feeling lonely. And then what are my options? And if I'm living in a community that's been created by a lot of the thoughts that are provided in this uh, film, I'm at a real advantage. And some communities don't have that built in. So there are some things we can do for ourselves. And that is the fir first is to say, I'm lonely. The second is to phone somebody who you know is filled up and healthy, not showing mental health stress because phoning them is gonna put extra stress. You wanna have, you know, you wanna have relationships that are healthy that you can lean on. And then the next step is to give to others what you want for yourself. And uh, I love the piece around food. We've got a um, little girl next door, um, Sarai, and she is homeschooling and she's cooking. And we, about once a week, are the benefactors because we're the old folks on, on, the, <laughs> <laughs> on the street. I do have a concern that um, when you're doing city planning that you isolate these communities for seniors. Um, I would love to see more buildings that aren't just adult buildings, but mix. Like, where are the where are the communities? I grew up in a farm, and then we had all kinds of people in the farming community. And when we put the the people that are on social insurance that have low incomes in one little grouping, and then we put our seniors in another little grouping, I think we're missing out on a huge aspect of humanity. Um, I do have three areas that we want to check in with ourselves around loneliness before I end my little piece here. Uh, I did read um, Vivek Murthy's book called Together, and it came out last year. Um, and he talked about th three key relationships. First is to have confidants. Uh, one, two, or three people that you can feel totally emotionally safe in that surrounding that you don't have to put on the face. You can be authentic. The second is a sense of a tight little belonging that might be in your family. I actually have two women, one's, one's 60 and one's 50, who asked me to be their pseudo mother because their families are not a particularly healthy environment. So I'm their mom. So I become for them this little belonging piece. And the third air area, which was covered very well in the movie is, is faith, volunteering, organizations such as Rotary, so that I feel I'm part of making difference, that I have a purpose for getting up in the morning, that I, my actions and my words can make a positive difference in the world. Thank you, Patricia. So what would you say to somebody who, um, is feeling lonely, but, it, but does not know how to express that. 
Right. Um, well, I gently curiously, if you're the person who's aware of that person, and by the way, a very good point was made in the movie that just because you are alone does not mean that you are lonely. The definition of loneliness from some of the researchers is the distance between the connection and relationships I want and what I have. If I have all the relationships and connections I want, then I'm not lonely. If I am not having the connections and relationships that I desire, then I, it's a setup for, long, for loneliness. So if you're approaching somebody, first step is to know that you are full yourself, that you're not going to them to fill your sense of connection and relationship. Um, I, I've got a couple people under my watch that you know, when I say what was helpful, they say my Prozac. So, you know, if I'm looking to get filled up, that's not the person I'm going to go to. So if you're going to go to somebody, make sure you're filled up first. Second of all is to go with a, a very heartfelt ear. Heart, you know, the best listening is ear and heart together. And to curiously, gently say, yeah, you're talking about anxiety. You're talking about you can hardly get out of the bed. Might you be feeling lonely just gently because we got that whole stigma going on uh and the third is acts that you can do with your your hands so i had a client who was uh, incredibly depressed and we did make some movement and she now makes soup for her condominium neighbors she makes little containers of soup and leaves it on the doorsteps, people she knows, and then she'll get either a knock on her door, thank you, or a phone call. She also started volunteering with immigrants, teaching them to speak our language more accurately. And so you mentioned food too. So, you know, we come back to this time and time again. <laughs> food is a great motivator and a great way to connect with others. It really, really is. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Patricia. My pleasure. Okay. Okay, so moving on, Dr. Pateau. So, Dr. Pateau, when we talk about factors, what would you say contributes to fostering a sense of collective agency in neighborhood and community levels? And how can this foster and accelerate positive civic engagement? Well, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, be, before I dig in, I just first want to say, it, I don't know how many people are watching this, you say maybe a hundred or two. Uh, I just want to say how valuable each of you are for tuning in and doing this. This is a major step. This is a beautiful film, and I just want to commend the filmmakers. But I want to say to everybody here, you you are loved. And I think I think that this is something that I saw in this in this film. It was a word that was danced around the entire film. Uh, Paul Bourne, who I who I've met, talked about collective altruism. Uh, those are good words, but I think the word that the film was dancing around, I'm going to just say it, is love. Love your neighbor. And this is something that we have framed a lot of neighborhood connections on for thousands of, of years. And I think this type of like personal affection for the people and place is a big part of it. And I think we're dancing around a lot of the ways that that might look, but I really do think it comes down to this heart posture. When we moved into our neighborhood, uh, we were one of the first homes on our street and we couldn't see a single green thing from our front porch. And I cried and I said to my wife, we made a big epic mistake moving into this new development. Uh, but th but what, what, what my wife said was she said, we don't move into beauty. We leave beauty in our wake. We are gonna love the people in this place here. And guess what happened? Our developers each put gave every house a tree and a rock. This was like what they gave us to uh, to us all. And then they left. And uh, the metaphor used in the film that I love absolutely is the metaphor of gardening because they might have all put a tree there, but it takes people who love a place to actually garden it. There's a big difference between landscape designers and gardeners. So design and gardening, these are two things that kind of play off each other. And I think I think that this is the metaphor that I love in this film because I think it draws us to a place where we to, to garden something, you must love it. You must like you must oogle over something blooming that's so small. Uh my daughter screamed out the other day that we had uh 
some uh, some shooting star, uh, little 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 pink uh, flowers coming up, and she was just screaming like these are here, these are here. And I think I think that this is what happens in our neighborhoods when we love it is when we see a little kid like. Today, Audrey, our neighbor, just took her uh, training wheels off of her bike, and her mom at the intersection was like pushing her along, and everybody was out like, because we know the journey that Audrey has been on to drop the training wheels, right? This is not something we can buy. This is not something we can manufacture. This is something that we can only do with a heart of love because we know Audrey. She peeks over my fence and looks at our bees and she has questions and, and she's just one of these kind of kids. And so we're all just cheering her on absolutely. And so I think that this is this sense of love of, of neighbor and gardening. It leads us to nurturing, which is a word that, I, that I've heard used. It leads to generosity. It leads to service. This is the heart that I think that we need. And But sometimes it's saying it outright and saying, I think we need to love our place and our people. And then this is the last thing I'm going to say is I need to be loved too. I thought for a while that I was kind of the great savior of my neighborhood, that I was the one coming in to love other people. And I learned I mo like I mostly need love. Like I'm built of the type of stuff that just needs to be loved. And and when I get authentic relationships of people who actually know what I'm going through and want to like stop by and say, hey, happy birthday. Like it was my 40th birthday and I was working in my basement and I heard a commotion outside and all my neighbors were out. They decorated things and they gave me a like a tiara that was blinking that said 40 <laughs> on it. And, and it's guess what? They loved me. And that was just as important for everybody. So eventually between love between neighbors is there's kind of a blurry line as to who's loving who at the end of the day. And so I think I think that we need to get quite quite human. And so I talk a lot about the neighbors being real. Like once we see people as real and human and we get to this like human scale of whether it's design or whether it's uh, social progress in our neighborhood i think something beautiful emer emerges there and so i saw that all over this this film so yeah thank you yeah ab absolutely and you know we talk about being human and loving everybody well out of this pandemic is definitely going to come that we are going to be more human mm. we are going to have that connection and that loving peace and i just got to say that everybody who's participating in this documentary tonight loves you dr poteau do not forget that <laughs> thank i receive the love come by anytime come by anytime <laughs> okay all of us 170 of us will be by especially to see you bees <laughs> thank you thank you so dr Elagni, sorry dr Elagni poor as a planner yourself how do you think developers and planners put the needs of the community first in ensuring that design and planning of our built environment and public spaces benefit the physical, mental and social health of individuals and communities as a whole? Thank you, Sharon. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, please let me answer your question first by a quote from Hook. Uh, who says a successful urban design ensures the health and quality of the places where people live, where the role of technology is integrated with people, urbanism, and nature in ways that are biologically and socially self-sustaining and mutually supportive of life systems. And to your question, um, I can frame the answer in a word that the purpose of urban planning has always been to meet the needs of people in the community based on their culture and traditions of every society. Even the history of urban planning goes back years ago and the legislation and zoning in urban planning uh, began about 100 years ago, which was with the goal to create safe living standards and work conditions to the benefit of the residents and to create better healthy social urban environments in cities and communities uh, for instance um, some of the health considerations were to reduce the air pollution and water pollution to improve safety for people at work and at home um, in our today modern world, uh, the arrival of automobile-based planning and urban sprawl, 
and success uh, subsequent um, neighborhood developments uh, has highly been problematic uh, on numerous counts. Um, engineering exercise out of our lives has disasters um, on disastrous effects on the health like uh, uh, residents. Dismantling proven approaches uh, for a street network design results in isolation, like people do not know each other, neighbors do not um, uh, recognize each other to live just side by side. Depression rates and disconnection overall between the residents are some of the side effects, right? The design and planning process basically to create a sustainable cities critical ending and analytical perspectives of both architectural aspect, urban planning visions together with understanding about human nature and uh, psychological aspects uh, of human well-being. Uh, we need to design for people. First, we need to understand their uh, um, spirituality demands, like um, the nature of people and how they want to social socialize and communicate with each other. Um, to achieve that, we need interconnected models of uh, urban planning by proposing holistic and integrated approaches that basically consider the whole system together. Uh, so we need to consider city planning like Gestalt theory or like human body. So different elements, they need to be there to work together to have a successful, successful urban planning. And not only one item or two items will work, it's like a holistic approach. Uh, in such a sustainable and complete community, there is a well-designed uh, and well-functioning built form that basically supports the health and public life with enough connection by bicycle, food, public transit, and vehicles to different destinations. Uh, people, they can communicate with each other um, on the road, uh, either in the bus or by walking on uh, um, pedestrian uh, walkways or, you know, like mm, different methods of communication between them. And as a matter of fact, they will be more social. They can have, uh, you know, coffee meetings or public gatherings in the local uh, commercial plaza, they can go to a local cafeteria. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, the local economy is also going to be enhanced because people, they will shop locally. And uh, all of a sudden, the whole neighborhood and community will be more livable. And what do we mean in planning by the term livability? It basically refers to the aspect of livable and healthy life standards on the street for the usage of human beings as the end users and the residents of such places. The sense of ownership uh, is another good result of uh, good community planning and uh, people, they feel they belong to that uh, neighborhood so they will be happier and feel more safe because they know their neighbors, right? Um, I argue that holistic and balanced strategies for planning and design can and must contribute uh, to more affordable, accessible, friendly, healthy and successful communities to the benefit of the residents. Um, in an age of declining resources, escalating urban growth, uncertainty in markets, and heightened prices at unforeseen scales, there is an undeniable need to tackle and solve problems with uh, new mindsets, emerging tools, and an eye to the whole ahead of the parts to create better places to the benefit of people. Attending to these uh, interconnected factors can translate to healthier, more active um, uh, environments, and um, it will be less likely to cause stress, depression, and uh, you know isolation um, yeah. for the residents. Yeah. Uh, and I can understand that environmental designers must assertively take into consideration a daunting area of uh, environmental, social, economic, cultural, and spirituality elements 
and do so in a far more integrated and holistic manner in order to attain and exceed the minimum uh, levels of sustainability and good place making practices. That's all I can say. Yeah, that's that's a lot you can say, and I think that uh, you know when we're designing and planning um, our communities, I think planners and developers can learn an awful lot from maybe the pandemic and also this documentary. So thank you very much. So I'm just conscious of the time, and I just want to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to um, to speak. So Dr. Hancock, when we talk about community design. How would you say that it's linked to the social determinants of health for residents? And how do we rebuild and repurpose spaces to ensure that there's a better medium for connection at all times? And that's, in, that's including the pandemic such as now. Well, let me preface this by saying that uh, 35 years ago, I helped to create what's become a global movement called Healthy Cities. And these days I'm working locally for a small NGO I've started up called Conversations for One Planet Region, which essentially integrates both health and sustainability. And so it talks about how to become a, a sustainable, um, healthy community. Fundamental to all of that, and in fact, in our definition of what constitutes a one planet community, we talk about this being for all residents. And when we talk about the social determinants of health, as you do in the question, and when we think about all, we need to be thinking about not so much how do we improve the health of the already healthiest, but how do we improve the health and the well-being of the least healthy? How do we deal with the vulnerable, the marginalized, the homeless, uh, the excluded? Um, the people who are not there, who are not, whose voices are not heard, and how do you engage them? And from the point of view of urban planning, how do you do that? How do you create more equitable living and working environments? One of the things to remember is that everywhere in, around the world, in cities and just generally, those marginalised, vulnerable, excluded people, you will find them downwind, downstream downhill. They live in the more dangerous, the least healthy places because that's the cheap place to live because they're driven there by higher prices elsewhere. So we need to be thinking about how do we how do we develop a community that doesn't simply push all the poor people into the worst areas and leave them there. At a perhaps more relatable way, um, one of the questions to ask yourself uh, is could your kids or grandkids afford to live near where you live? And usually you will find people say, no, they couldn't. A lot of people will. Um, and that is because we have created zoning. We just did, we have a monthly conversation. Our conversation in May brought together a, a small developer, uh, a, a green architect and a planning consultant. And they were talking about how do you build for a one planet region? and. The developer, for example, is trying to put on a fairly large single family lot, a very attractive looking two story building with seven or eight units in it that is designed to be car free. So it's and it's much more compact uh, and very neighborly, having all sorts of trouble getting it in because the zoning simply doesn't allow for that kind of thing. Um, but it's what we need to build. It's what urban planners uh, call the missing middle. So we have the high end cost places and we have the low end cost places. And we're not building for the missing middle, the, the, the people in the middle. And that's that's maybe your grandkids or kids. Could they rent a, a place near you? Are there rental places near you where they could rent? Because they're probably not going to make the money you're making when they're starting out. But that doesn't mean they have to be forced to move away if they don't want to. Um, how do we build affordable mixed income, multi-generational um, uh, places? How do we avoid those income ghettos, those gated communities? Uh, in which case, as soon as you've got income ghettos and gated communities, it's no longer we, it's them and us. It's no longer community, it's division. Um, and I think in thinking about all these sorts of things, one of the conclusions I came to listening to the discussion, which partly was about the resistance there is to putting in affordable housing in established neighborhoods, 
is that I think we conflate affordable and social and supportive and what people are beginning to call complex care um, or sheltered housing. And it, it becomes associated with people's minds with the idea of affordable housing means you're going to put a bunch of drag addicts on my street and I'm not having that. Yeah. That's completely wrong, but yeah. it's, it's what's got into people's consciousness. So as much as anything, this is about how do we change the conversation about yeah. what makes for good development, good planning. A couple of other quick points around um, uh, this uh, that I'll just throw out. Parks and green space. Um, and, and you had that lovely conversation with the guy from South, uh, South LA. Um, if you look at who has big, beautiful parks, it's not low income neighborhoods. But if you think about the determinants of health and how access to nature and access to recreation and relaxation is important, we actually need to be building better, more beautiful, more accessible parks in low income neighborhoods instead of yep. if we've tended to build them in high income neighborhoods. So there's a whole lot of equity issues that need to come into thinking about how we design for community. And you can't be community if it's them and us. I, absolutely, I, I agree. I think there's further conversation to be had around that. I am sorry to rush you. And, you know, I just want to make sure that we have time for some uh, Q and A's. So thank you very much for that. And Heather, um, just thinking about local capacity, what are some of the ways that you would say that cities across Canada are positioning themselves to perhaps build and support the creation and establishment of resilient communities? So I think um, I, just learning from, from the pandemic. So can, what we're realizing now across Canada is that community is not something that we provide service to community is the solution. And when when COVID hit, uh, government and organizations couldn't react fast enough. It was neighbors who reacted fast enough and the care mongering that happened. And so we we need to, the cities are reflecting upon what have we learned from the pandemic? Um, and we made communities unessential. That's what happened during the pandemic. We closed parks, libraries, um, recreation centers, trails. And so uh, cities are realizing that, you know, by doing that, th that increases loneliness, which was already on the rise prior to it. Um, in it increased the distance between institutions and organizations. They either stopped collaborating with each other or they had to shut their doors. Um, we labeled people. We called we called people non-essential. Uh, they questioned their contribution to community. Volunteers were labeled unessential. Um, healthcare emergencies. We had to have a conversation about value of life. Um, and we developed a nanny state. Governments had to make a hard decision about, you know, laws about house arrest and closing parks and, you know, um, policing social behavior. So when you take all that into effect, um, cities across Canada are realizing that they have to invest in community. And how yeah. they're doing that? is asset-based community development yeah um using an asset-based community development approach and this is probably going to answer carrie's um chat or um question or comment in the chat box and that asset-based community development looks for and starts with people's gifts and assets they yeah. equip people to create local opportunities and respond to the needs and challenges in their community um how this answers her question is that if you use an asset-based approach um, you ask these three questions. What can neighbors do for themselves? So in this, in this retirement home, what can they do? They should be organizing their own social activities. Cities, cities should be working with what community can always do. What can neighbors do that they need support with? So then that's where the cities can say, you know what? Here are some things we can do to support what community already can do. And then what can't neighbors do? that the city needs to do or the communities or agencies need to do. And once we know our roles in community, I think that that's how you're going to build a resilient community. I had a lot more to say, but I really condensed it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And again, you know, we've had some great discussion and some great answering to the questions and I would hate to cut anybody short, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, Danielle. So we actually, as the panelists came on, we actually addressed many of the questions that were on. So we're actually at the conclusion portion now, which is amazing because we're right on time. 
Um, but if there are any last remarks from the panelists, um, you can uh, share them. If not, I'll um, go on with our closing remarks. Okay. Well, we want to thank you all for attending tonight's event and big thanks to our planning committee. Our goal is to continue facilitating community dialogues on resilience and connections, and we hope that you will join us on that journey. So as a token of our appreciation, we have two baskets that we have drawn for during today's um, event. So Rebecca Delacudis and Michelle Spencer, you are the winners. So we have these beautiful baskets that we will be mailing off to you um, once including a book by Dr. Puto, who joined us this evening and a gift card for cobs and chocolate and a little handcrafted item. And the other has a book, um, same, same items, but it has a book around customer's history, which we hope that you enjoy. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight and we'll be in touch and hope to see you all in the future. Have a good evening. <laughs>